In our discussion of urinary tract infections, we turn to cystitis. To define it, we'd call it a clinical syndrome characterized by dysuria, frequency, urgency, and occasionally suprapubic tenderness caused by inflammation and infection of the bladder. It's a disease that's much more common in women than men. In fact, women have an incidence of asymptomatic bacteriuria of around 1 to 3 percent. Up to 60 percent of women have had at least one episode of cystitis during their lifetime, and 10 percent have it once a year. The peak incidence is among young, sexually active women, 18 to 24 years of age. And two to 5% have recurrent problems with cystitis. Men, on the other hand, have a very low prevalence of cystitis, less than 0.1%. And when a man has cystitis, we have to look for a complication because there's usually some kind of obstructive uropathy, duplicating collecting system, some kind of anatomical explanation for cystitis. And we have to work them up for urologic abnormalities. The lack of circumcision predisposes some men to cystitis and among men who have sex with men, anal insertive sexual intercourse is a predisposing factor. Ninety-five percent of the time, the cause is a single species of bacterium, so polymicrobial infections are unusual. The most common bug is, as you might expect, Escherichia coli. Now, we have lots of E. coli in our intestine, lots of them, but only about 20 percent of these E. coli are what we would call uropathogenic E. coli. So these E. coli are different. They possess virulence factors that the other E. coli do not have that allow them to colonize and invade the urinary tract. Most of them have what we call type 1 fimbriae, this fringe that's around the surface. And this group of fimbriae can attach to mannose residues, which we find commonly on the glycoproteins on urothelium. And so they can attach to urothelium and they're not washed away in the urinary stream. And these are called mannose sensitive E. coli. And the other E. coli's don't have them. And furthermore, the normal urinary tract has a defense me mechanism. There is a glycoprotein present in trace amounts in urine. It's called uromodulin. The old name is Tam Horsfall protein. And this uromodulin has mannose residues on it. So these mannose sensitive E. coli will bind to the uromodulin and then be washed away in the urine stream. So they never get a chance to attach because of the uromodulin that's present normally in urine. Now, recurrent and complicated cystitis, it leads to an increased incidence of more resistant organisms that we don't usually find causing cystitis. And that would be, for example, Proteus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Enterobacter species, and even some resistant E. coli, and among the gram-positives, Enterococcus. The urinary tract does have some defense against the urinary tract pathogens. It's got these glycosaminoglycans, or GAG layer, that's in the normal mucus of the urinary tract. And this is a sulfonated surface polysaccharide that covers the umbrella cells and the surface mucosal cells that are polyploid or octoploid with their tight junction. So you got this lining that covers that. And this glycosaminoglycan prevents the passage of urine into or through superficial cells. And one point I'd like to make about it is that there are patients who have a condition called interstitial cystitis 
where this glycosaminoglycan is not intact. And since urine is normally acid, you can get acid urine into the deep layers of the bladder. And these poor patients have a chronic problem with cystitis, but it's not of an infectious nature. Now back to cystitis. The shorter urethra in women is obviously closer to the anus and closer to colonic flora. And so the organisms that are going to cause urinary tract infection are in the vaginal introitus and the periurethral area. And when the urethra is massaged in women, especially by sexual intercourse, those bacteria can be forced into the bladder. Furthermore, if the bacteria are motile, they can actually ascend the urinary tract against the urine stream. Most notorious among these bugs would be Proteus, which has swarming motility in many species. Now, how does it present cystitis in children? It's pretty nonspecific. You can't tell that a child is having problems unless they're, for example, having enuresis, a child that wasn't bedwetting and now starts bedwetting. Fever may be a clue, failure to thrive in infants, and if they start vomiting, you know, a good pediatrician or family physician is going to be thinking of an infection. Now, in women, almost all of them have frequent painful urination of small amounts of turbid urine. They may also have kind of suprapubic pain or heaviness, and they usually do not have fever. Now in men, they have some of the same symptoms, but if they've got fever, it may be a focus in the prostate gland, or worse, it could be a kidney infection, pyelonephritis.